The Ancient City, Book 3, Chapter 4, The City. Kivitas and Urbs, either of which we translate by the word city, were not synonymous words among the ancients. Kivitas was the religious and political association of families and tribes. Urbs was the place of assembly, the dwelling place, and above all the sanctuary of this association. We are not to picture ancient cities to ourselves as anything like what we see in our day. We build a few houses. It is a village. Insensibly, the number of houses increases, and it becomes a city. And finally, if there is occasion for it, we surround this with a wall. With the ancients, a city was never formed by degrees, by the slow increase of the number of men and houses. They founded a city at once, all entire in a day, but the elements of the city needed to be first ready, and this was the most difficult and ordinarily the largest work. As soon as the families, the fratries, and the tribes had agreed to unite and have the same worship, they immediately founded the city as a sanctuary for this common worship and thus the foundation of the city was always a religious act. As a first example, we will take Rome itself, notwithstanding the doubt that is attached to its early history. It has often been said that Romulus was chief of a band of adventurers, and that he formed a people by calling around him vagabonds and robbers, and that all these men, collected without distinction, built at hazard a few huts to shelter their booty. But ancient writers present the facts in quite another shape, and it seems to us that if we desire to understand antiquity, our first rule should be to support ourselves upon the evidence that comes from the ancients. Those writers do indeed mention an asylum, that is to say, a sacred enclosure, where Romulus admitted all who presented themselves, and in this he followed the example which many founders of cities had afforded him. But this asylum was not the city. It was not even opened till after the city had been founded and completely built. It was an appendage added to Rome, but it was not Rome. It did not even form a part of the city of Romulus, for it was situated at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, whilst the city occupied the Palatine. It is of the first importance to distinguish the double element of the Roman population. In the asylum are adventurers without land or religion. On the Palatine are men from Alba, that is to say, men already organized into a society, distributed into gentes and curies, having a domestic worship and laws. The asylum is merely a hamlet or suburb where the huts are built at hazard and without rule. On the Palatine rises a city, religious and holy. As to the manner in which this city was founded, antiquity abounds in information. We find it in Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who collected it from authors older than his time. We find it in Plutarch, in the Fasti of Ovid, in Tacitus, in Cato the Elder, who had consulted the ancient Annals, and in two other writers who ought above all to inspire us with great confidence, the learned Varro and the learned Varius Flaccus, whom Festus had, has preserved in part for us, both men deeply versed in Roman antiquities, lovers of truth, and in no wise credulous, and well acquainted with the rules of historical criticism. All these writers have transmitted to us the tradition of the religious ceremony which marked the foundation of Rome, and we are not prepared to reject so great a number of witnesses. It is not a rare thing for the ancients to relate facts that surprise us, but is this a reason why we should pronounce them fables? Above all, if these facts, though not in accord with modern ideas, agree perfectly with those of the ancients, we have seen in their private life a religion which regulated all their acts. Later, we saw that this religion established them in communities. Why does it astonish us after this that the foundation of a city was a sacred act, and that Romulus himself was obliged to perform rites which were observed everywhere? The first care of the founder was to choose the site for the new city. But this choice, 
a weighty question on which they believed the destiny of the people depended, was always left to the decision of the gods. If Romulus had been a Greek, he would have consulted the oracle of Delphi. If a Samnite, he would have followed the sacred animal, the wolf, or the green woodpecker. Being a Latin, and a neighbor of the Etruscans, initiated into the augurial science, he asks the gods to reveal their will to him by the flight of birds. The gods point out the Palatine. The day for the foundation having arrived, he first offers a sacrifice. His companions are ranged around him, they light a fire of brushwood, and each one leaps through the flame. The explanation of this rite is that, for the act about to take place, it is necessary that the people be pure and the ancients believed they could purify themselves from all stain, physical or moral, by leaping through a sacred flame. When this preliminary ceremony had prepared the people for the grand act of the foundation, Romulus dug a small trench of a circular form and threw into it a clod of earth which he had brought from the city of Alba. Then each of his companions, approaching by turns, following his example, threw in a little earth which he had brought from the country from which he had come. This rite is remarkable, and reveals to us a notion of the ancients to which we must call attention. Before coming to the Palatine, they had lived in Alba, or some other neighboring city. There was their sacred fire, there their fathers had lived and been buried. Now their religion forbade them to quit the land where the hearth had been established, and where their divine ancestors reposed. It was necessary then, in order to be free from all impiety, that each of these men should employ a fiction, and that he should carry with him, under the symbol of a clod of earth, the sacred soil where his ancestors were buried, and to which their manas were attached. A man could not quit his dwelling place without taking with him his soil and his ancestors. This rite had to be accomplished, so that he might say, pointing to out the new place which he had adopted, this is still the land of my fathers, terra patrum, patria. Here is my country, for here are the manas of my family. The trench into which each one had thrown a little earth was called mundus. Now this word designated in the ancient language the region of the manas. From this place, according to tradition, the souls of the dead escaped three times a year, desirous of again seeing the light for a moment. Do we not see also in this tradition the real thought of these ancient men? When placing in the trench a clod of earth from their former country, they believed they had enclosed there the souls of their ancestors. These souls, reunited there, required a perpetual worship, and kept guard over their descendants. At this same place Romulus set up an altar, and lighted a fire upon it, this was the holy fire of the city. Around this hearth arose the city as the house rises around the domestic hearth. Romulus traced a furrow which marked the enclosure. Here, too, the smallest details were fixed by a ritual. The founder made use of a copper plowshare. His plow was drawn by a white bull and a white cow. Romulus, with his head veiled and in the priestly robes, himself held the handle of the plow and directed it, while chanting prayers. His companions followed him, observing a religious silence. As the plow turned up clods of earth, they carefully threw them within the enclosure, that no particle of this sacred earth should be on the side of the stranger. This enclosure, traced by religion, was inviolable. Neither stranger nor citizen had the right to cross over it. To leap over this little furrow was an impious act. It is a Roman tradition that the founder's brother committed this act of sacrilege and paid for it with his life. But in order that men might enter and leave the city, the furrow was interrupted in certain places. To accomplish this, Romulus raised the plow and carried it over. These intervals were called porte. They were the gates of the city. Upon the sacred furrow, or a little inside of it, the walls afterwards arose. They also were sacred. No one could touch them, even to repair them, without permission from the pontiffs. 
On both sides of this wall, a space, a few paces wide, was given up to religion, and was called the Pomorium. On this space no plow could be used, no building constructed. Such, according to a multitude of ancient witnesses, was the ceremony of the foundation of Rome. If it is asked how this information was preserved down to the writers who have transmitted it to us, the answer is that the ceremony was recalled to the memory of the people every year by an anniversary festival, which they called the birthday of Rome. This festival was celebrated through all antiquity, from year to year, and the Roman people still celebrate it today, at the same date as formerly, the 21st of April. So faithful are men to old usages through incessant changes. We cannot reasonably suppose that such rites were observed for the first time by Romulus. It is certain, on the contrary, that many cities before Rome had been founded in the same manner. According to Varro, these rites were common to Latium and to Etruria. Cato the Elder, who, in order to write his Origines, had consulted the annals of all the Italian nations, informs us that analogous rites were practiced by all founders of cities. The Etruscans possessed liturgical books in which were recorded the complete ritual of these ceremonies. The Greeks, like the Italians, believed that the site of a city should be chosen and revealed by the divinity. So, when they wished to found one, they consulted the oracle at Delphi. Herodotus records, as an act of impiety or madness, that the Spartan Doreus dared to build a city without consulting the oracle and without observing any of the customary usages. And the pious historian is not surprised that a city thus constructed, in despite of the rules, lasted only three years. Thucydides, recalling the day when Sparta was founded, mentions the pious chants and the sacrifices of that day. The same historian tells us that the Athenians had a particular ritual, and that they never founded a colony without conforming to it. We may see in a comedy of Aristophanes a sufficiently exact picture of the ceremony practiced in such cases. When the poet represented the amusing foundation of the city of the birds, he certainly had in mind the customs which were observed in the foundation of the cities of men. Now, he puts upon the scene a priest who lighted a fire while invoking the gods, a poet who sang hymns, and a divine who recited oracles. Pausanias traveled in Greece about Adrian's time. In Messenia, he had the priests describe to him the foundation of the city of Messina, and he has transmitted this account to us. This event was not very ancient. It took place in the time of Epaminondas. Three centuries before, the Messenians had been driven from their country, and since that time they had lived dispersed among the other Greeks, without a country, but preserving their customs and their national religion with pious care. The Thebans wished to restore them to Peloponnesus, in order to place an enemy on the flank of the Spartans, but the most difficult thing was to persuade the Messenians. Epaminondas, having superstitious men to deal with, thought it his duty to circulate an oracle predicting for this people a return to their former country. Miraculous apparitions proved to them that their gods, who had betrayed them at the time of the conquest, had again become favorable. This timid people then decided to return to the Peloponnesus in the train of a Theban army. But the question was where a city should be built, for it would not do to think of reoccupying the old cities of the country. They had been soiled by the conquest. To choose the place where they should establish themselves, they could not have recourse to the Delphian oracle, for at this time the Pythia was favorable to the Spartans. Fortunately, the gods had other methods of revealing their will. A Mycenaean priest had a dream in which one of the gods of his nation appeared and directed him to take his station on Mount Ithome, and invite the people to follow him there. The site of the new city was thus indicated, but it was still necessary to know the rites to be performed at the foundation, for the Mycenaeans had forgotten them. They could not adopt those of the Thebans, or of any other people, and so they did not know how to build the city. 
A dream, however, came very opportunely to another Messenian. The gods commanded him to ascend Mount Ithome and find a yew tree that stood near a myrtle, and to dig into the earth in that place. He obeyed, and discovered an urn, and in this urn were leaves of tin, on which was found engraved the complete ritual of the sacred ceremony. The priests immediately copied it and inscribed it in their books. They did not doubt that the urn had been deposited there by an ancient king of the Messenians before the conquest of the country. As soon as they were in possession of the ritual, the foundation commenced. First, the priests offered a sacrifice. They invoked the ancient gods of the Messenians, the Dioscuri, the Jupiter of Ithome, and the ancient heroes, ancestors known and venerated. All these protectors of the country had apparently quitted it, according to the belief of the ancients, on the day when the enemy became masters of it. They were entreated to return. Formulas were pronounced which, it was believed, would determine them to inhabit the new city in common with the citizens. This was the great object. To fix the residence of the gods with themselves was what these men had the most at heart, and we may be sure that the religious ceremony had no other aim. Just as the companions of Romulus dug a trench and thought to bury the manas of their ancestors there, so the contemporaries of Epaminondas called to themselves their heroes, their divine ancestors, and the gods of their country. They thought that by rites and formulas they could attach these sacred beings to the soil which they themselves were going to occupy, and could shut them up within the enclosure which themselves were about to trace. And they said to them, Come with us, O divine kings, and dwell with us in this city. The first day was occupied with these sacrifices and these prayers. The next day the boundaries were traced, whilst the people sang religious hymns. We are surprised at first when we see in the ancient authors that there was no city, however ancient it might be, which did not pretend to know the name of its founder and the date of its foundation. This is because a city could not lose the recollection of the sacred ceremony which had marked its birth. For every year it celebrated the anniversary of this birthday with a sacrifice. Athens, as well as Rome, celebrated its birthday. It often happened that colonists or conquerors established themselves in a city already built. They had not to build houses, for nothing opposed their occupying those of the vanquished, but they had to perform the ceremony of foundation, that is, to establish their sacred fires and to fix their national gods in their new home. This explains the statements of Thucydides and Herodotus that the Dorians founded Lacedaemon and the Ionians Miletus, though these two tribes found Lacedaemon and Miletus built and already very ancient. These usages show clearly what a city was in the opinion of the ancients. Surrounded by a sacred enclosure and extending around an altar, it was the religious abode of gods and citizens. Livy said of Rome, There is not a place in this city which is not impregnated with religion and which is not occupied by some divinity. The gods inhabit it. What Livy said of Rome, any man might say of his own city, for if it had been founded according to the rites, it had received within its walls protecting gods, who were, as we may say, implanted in its soil, and could never quit it. Every city was a sanctuary. Every city might be called holy. As the gods were attached to a city forever, so the people could never again abandon a place where their gods were established. In this respect, there was a reciprocal engagement, a sort of contract between gods and men. At one time, the tribunes of the people proposed, as Rome, devastated by the Gauls, was no longer anything but a heap of ruins, and as, five leagues distant, there was a city, all built, large, beautiful, well-situated, and without inhabitants, since the Romans had conquered it, that the people should abandon the ruins of Rome and remove to Veii. But the pious Camillus replied, Our city was religiously founded. The gods themselves pointed out the place and took up their abode here with our fathers. Ruined as it is, it still remains the dwelling of our national gods. And, 
the Romans remained at Rome. Something sacred and divine was naturally associated with these cities which the gods had founded, and which they continued to fill with their presence. We know that Roman traditions promised that Rome should be eternal. Every city had similar traditions. The ancients built all their cities to be eternal.